All right. Um, From the Ground Up is a project that uh, a group of my research students, some fresh young mechanical engineering graduates, and some volunteers who um, were self-employed at the time um, got together to work on probably for the same reason a lot of people are interested because there was a big idea that we could do things new in Christchurch with the rebuild. We could do things in a new way. We just needed to figure out how to go about that. So the, the small group included uh, myself, PhD student, like I said, kind of heavy on the engineering side because what we were thinking was, well, the thing that maybe we could add to this whole conversation is that underlying structural question. If right now we all felt the earth shake, (laughs) I don't know what you all would think, but the thing that always runs through my mind is, boy, I hope the foundations people knew what they were doing. And boy, I hope the structural engineers knew what they were doing, right? If we didn't get it right from the ground up, when there's a bit of a perturbation, then we could be in trouble. And our cities that same way from the ground up, We've got to have our environmental right. We've got to have our transport right. We've got to have our social connections right. We've got to have our commerce right. We've got to have our wastewater right. There's so many things we have to get right before we wonder too much about what what the buildings are going to look like. (laughs) And yet, at that point last summer, the conversation seemed to be pretty heavily skewed to what our big crown jewel projects were going to be, how big they were going to be, you know, really that sort of, yeah, but, but if we don't do this whole city right, it's not going to be able to adapt to the things that are coming in the future, it's not going to be resilient to any other perturbations that we might have. Let's, let's see what happens if we look at things from the ground up. So that was our project. And I think we were looking at the same thing everyone else was, we have a chance now to do something in a way that gives us not just back the city we had, but a city that that could be better in a lot of ways. And what we really need, we have dire needs in this too. It's not just that it'd be nice to redo Christchurch in a new way. It's that we have some pretty serious needs of our neighbors. Um, How are we gonna get 20,000 homes for people who don't have them right now? Well, we could do greenfield development, and we know we could, (laughs) that would be quick and easy. We know where to put that and we know how to do it. We could do brownfield development, so that's ex-industrial areas. Um, I don't think that's going to be greenfield. I think that those processes are a bit tricky and the locations are a bit um, questionable. And then we have the city center. Well, we all know that's kind of where a lot of housing should go, but when? I think we'll get our 40,000 greenfield houses before we figure out how to get along and get a city center sorted out. The big guys with the, you know, the big projects downtown, they'll do what they want to do. Um, What in the world are we going to do? So looking at what's been done around the world, there's a lot of work for people who want to figure out how to do things, which is what researchers do, in gray field redevelopment. If you look at the past history of cities, um, there was a good reason why people wanted to go out at the end of those tram lines and live in, um, in neighborhoods out there that were, you know, sort of walkable, more like the small towns that a lot of them had actually moved from to the city. The air was cleaner out there and that way of life actually worked pretty good. Now those areas are inner suburbs <laughs> and they're quite old and they're getting run down. But man, have they got a nice location, especially if we're looking forward in time to when our tram system's probably going to be brought back just because of the way things are going to evolve. Um, I put up a picture here of Christchurch some time ago and Grayfield development, I just want to be clear, it's always a big temptation to say, well, let's go back to the way things were. So if we look at this picture from the 1920s or so, um, I see definitely that we've got, uh, you know, 100 years of technology change there. But do you know what else I see? Look close. What's different about that place? Lots of people walking. There's people everywhere. You're right. That's what's different. You know what else is different? There's no sidewalks. There's no curbs. There's no signals. There's no crossing signals. The people are there. That's their place. And... Look at the the car in the middle there is stopped and people are talking to them. (laughs) 
<laughs> and the other people don't seem disturbed by that. So this idea that a city was actually a place for people, and if you were crazy enough to drive your automobile there, well, then you had to negotiate how you were going to do that and not bother anybody because that wasn't the place for automobiles. And these big questions about when automobiles go there, should they be allowed to just stop wherever they want and just leave their car? Because that gets in people's way, you know? Man, are things different then? And I think to a certain extent, yes, we want to understand every lesson that history has to tell us about places, about human scale, about how things can work, and we definitely want to learn every lesson that the rest of the world, where they've tried different things, have to teach us. Um, so that's sort of what we did. And the way we put it together was um, more like an engineering approach, I think. We said from the ground up, and that's what we meant. Let's look at the foundations, first foundations meaning foundations, soils, that sort of thing, but then also connections between places, these human scales, the way things work by doing research from around the world on how to put things together. Now, this is, of course, mechanical engineering interpretation of all this information that we, we delve into, but we did have a pretty good range of people on our, um, um, on our, in our group. So starting at the bottom, um, if we are going to have any chance of beating the greenfield redevelopment, we have to build on solid ground first. There's lots of places around the city where we can build things, but here is the land that we don't have to come up with new designs for foundations or get special consents. So we're looking inside the urban area in that area to the west of the central city. Um, we are looking for properties which right now have a big development potential. Redevelopment of old areas means that's what we want to do. We want to look for places where the property value is lower than what we would expect. So here we're looking for these dark blue and blue. And again, in this western area with the solid soils, we see definitely that there's a chance for that. There's, there's some areas that haven't been redeveloped yet. Um, age of the house, if we're looking at anything pre-1980, we're looking at things that um, are substandard, quite substandard. Have we got any of that on this solid soil area? And the answer is yes, we do. There's been some other things um, built in there, but uh, we definitely have these pockets, these pretty big areas, um, at least as big as some of those big greenfield subdivisions. Um, integration and connection is a huge thing that makes a city work, that the city's foundation has to be built on interconnectivity. So we looked for that too. What are the things that people go to that, that people need access to around the city? Um, and looked at how those all connect up in this area that we're looking at. And then we looked at, um, okay, the, the assets that are already there. We said the houses that we're looking for for redevelopment aren't the best assets. They're actually something that needs a new look. But other things, sewer systems, water systems, parks, landscapes, shops, medical, schools, these are community assets that we're looking for um, to understand and to keep and to develop even further. So here's what we found as a good redevelopment opportunity is Rickerton, that area on solid soils, connected to everything, right in the middle of everything. And sure enough, good old Rickerton was one of the first ex or it was exurban at the time, um, now inner suburbs that was built along a tram line that people could go live in a nice place. And it was built around the University of Canterbury because that was a new big employment um, out there in the 60s. So it really grew up around that as well. All right, now if we want to see what this would be like, because it's, it's a good idea to prospect and find the place where you do a development, but now we got to understand what's the business proposition here? How does this work? And what are the obstacles that we have to deal with? So we did a multi-objective design on this, and that just means looking at all the different things together, transport, housing, commercial, um, and trying to do some optimization on all of those, as well as looking at this project as a 50-year project. Not right now, we bulldoze Rickerton and start over. <laughs> but then we, we look at next year, what could we do? And how would that drive the next thing that we do and drive the next thing that we do? And add competency and understanding and learning so that we could do more of it. And it would all start to feed back on itself and become better all the way along. So we're looking for those little seeds to plant 
and how that progresses over 50 years until it's all finished. So sometimes what I'm gonna tell you is on the near scale and sometimes on the far scale, but let's, let's just be clear that the project itself is a 50 year project. All right, um, the engineering methods, we used a lot of the methods that we've developed in my research group, which lets you assess basically the foundations of your transport system for people and for goods. That is a new thing. We don't have a whole lot of that right now. We definitely have transport engineering, but it's more about the flows of cars. And what we actually need is to understand the connectivity and the accessibility of places on the human scale. So that's the sort of thing we've been doing. And I just popped in some pictures of what that looks like when we do it. But also understanding the flow of money through this thing. How when you're uh, you know, spending money, it should be on your foundations on the things that actually will transition and will um, adapt as you go along, not on what it seems like you need right now. You've got to have this longer perspective. So on the left, the red car-oriented development, that's sort of the way we do things now, where you've got to fight for your itty-bitty scrap for a bit of cycle um, paint. <laughs> but um, we actually think, no, you need, to, you need to actually understand the whole fabric of an area and how it would work and spend the money appropriately on that. So this new Ricketer and urban area that we're talking about, um, the group just spent an awful lot of time sitting down looking at, at each bit of this area and how it would go together and um, understanding flows, connections, all these things that we've been talking about and just how big are these areas? Because, um, you know, here's, uh, uh, we've broken up the area into four corridors. One, say 28 hectares, does that seem like a big place? Is that do we even have a sense of what a piece of an urban area is? Well, each one of these pieces is roughly the size of the University of Canterbury campus. And I know I can walk from this side, which is one extreme, over to the rec center on the other side, which is the other extreme, in less than 10 minutes. So while it seems like looking at it, it's a long ways because normally we just drive to the shop or something like that. In reality, because we don't actually know it as a walkable place, we can, you know, through geography and measurements, actually understand that it is. So that's um, what we're looking at. And um, what we know from around the world when people develop these size areas, and we're talking about um, four to 6,000 people in each of these areas um, living there, but also living there, like there's lots of things to do there. Um, you have to give them their place. You have to give them a walkable um, environment. And so each of those areas has their own sort of mini square. And on the New Zealand theme, you can maybe understand it as a corner dairy. But whereas corner dairies are, are outside, you know, they're, they're along a street and you have to sort of fight traffic to get to them and they aren't really a place. You go there to get something. Um, and the commerce builds on, its, on each other, on their neighbors, because you go there for one thing and you can get something else. Think about if that was actually a place. What if, it, what if you turned it inside and surrounded it by 5,000 people or so? Then the commerce there could really um, zing and it would be a place you'd go to because it's nice, not because you needed a liter of milk. <laughs> All right, so that's the idea. And also what you'll see is in the business plan, that's the idea of what you build first. I know we need the houses, but if you start with the proposition of houses plus these squares, you can actually increase the value of that whole thing to where you can get the attention of people who, who um, otherwise are just gonna go and build outside the city somewhere. All right. So can 20,000 people actually live in New Rickerton? And the answer is yes, quite comfortably. It's not even considered really medium, medium density housing by the rest of the world. It's on the cusp of being medium density housing. So it's not a crowd, which is what we're getting through the reef, um, this infill that we're doing, where we buy one of these old houses, build four or five townhouses on it. That's just crowded. It's not nicer. There's, any, there's not any new amenities. It's not any more accessible or walkable or anything. It's just crowded. So if we're going to do this in a different way, um, we're going to have to do better than that. But we're going to get a density that's, that's even a tad bit less than if we were to just infill. Um, so the smart city land use, uh, just using what's known from around the world, using heights that we know um, aren't really obtrusive at all and are definitely size, size, seismicity height, especially on this TC1 land, isn't an issue. What's the issue is what's economical, all right? 
And so that's what we're going to do because what's most important is that a lot of this new housing is affordable. We can't get away with running people out of our city anymore because they can't afford us. Um, you know, that, that sort of development, we know where that leads. We've seen it around the world. If you price people out of living in your city, it doesn't go all that well. All right, so I just want to let you know, we looked at all sorts of other things about integrated land use and um, active accessibility, these sorts of things, and how those would roll out over time, where you would start, what you would do, how can people actually get around in this space? And yes, it's 10 minute walk from the outside of this whole new Rickerton to the inside. That is absolutely 100% accessible and walkable. So, um, and yeah, a four minute cycle ride. <laughs> so to get to the edge of this development, which on the south edge is a huge amount of um, industrial jobs and a quick tram ride six kilometers away is the central city. And a quick tram ride six kilometers the other way is Hornby, another big industrial area. So there's, this is really a sweet spot, we think. Um, oh, and it's butts up against the University of Canterbury with 20,000 people going there every day that also has a very big need for housing. So transportation, I just talked about um, these tramways. All right, right now, we're being told we can't afford tramways. But right now, what people are talking about tramways is those things out to the green fields. And you're right, you can never afford those. <laughs> but if each kilometer um, is done correctly and has a lot of ridership on it, what we were looking for was what would it take to get a payback, to get profitability within just a couple of years? What would it actually take? And then let's figure out how to do that. So um, integrated development, um, there's a lot of things that can be done here that we found, um, you know, why not? What I'm going to talk about, hopefully, what we're going to talk about is how we would actually do it. You know, we don't have to invent a whole lot of new things here, except how to cooperate. <laughs> That's going to be a fun part. So I just thought I'd inspire you with what we might get if we were to cooperate, if we were to figure out how to get all these neighbors to cooperate and agree to take a little bit of chance and do something um, so that the outcome is amazing. Um, do you, Remember Soul Square or Knights Lane, some of these interesting places that were downtown? Um, do you kind of miss that at all? <laughs> I know the students at Canterbury miss it a lot. And I know that the people who developed those are having a hard time getting them back because they have to be surrounded by people to work. So, um, so what if that's what we built first? What if we got that, you know, the guy who built Soul Square in the first place and got them to, to build us another one right near University of Canterbury in a way that it becomes a college town, right around there. That this new housing, um, I just put some concept housing there that's around the square. Um, lots of students can live in there. They can walk to the university. They don't need cars. Wouldn't that be, if we were gonna pick something easy to do, wouldn't that be the one? If we were gonna pick something that only displaced maybe 18 people wouldn't that be the one to do? If we were going to figure out this process of how to cooperate, how to put together all the different pieces that we need to, you know, our stormwaters, our traffic management, all these different things, pick a winner first, learn how to do it, build up those, those processes of how we're going to have this conversation with the council and with the regional people and the local people. All right. Next, I would pick one that's in this family-oriented area right next to all that employment. And again, let's include the square in it. Let's include the place where the kids would go play. Let's, in, let's include that. And it's commercial property and it has jobs and it has businesses. And yeah, some pretty high density housing around there, but that is what we are really in need of right now. So again, pick the winners, pick the easy thing to do first. And again, it just sits off that beginning We've got plenty of lower density, older housing, if anybody just really doesn't want a nice new condominium. And um, we did also do some preliminary estimates because I wanted to know, can we actually, through this kind of development, through taking advantage of all that land that right now isn't productive because it's mostly in street, verge, sidewalk, driveway, you know, there's a lot of land that you could sell. 
So what if we turn that over? Could we actually get a condominium with two bedrooms in a very nice facility that a, say, divorced mother with one child could afford for, for um, 70000 or less? And I think we actually could. It's a matter of deciding that that's what we're going to do. So, um, and we do have to be extremely smart about every step of it, <laughs> including getting, you know, consent over the whole thing. Just, just, you know, as you start to look at what all the costs are for building things, um, and I know the market dictates what the price is, but maybe that's more what our social housing looks like in the future. Not so much that, that we have to build houses for people to get into, but that we have to build places that people can own um, at an affordable level. So something that reflects our heritage might be another place we, we go in for, and then possibly something that reflects the Asia Pacific. You know, there's just all sorts of style things that can be done, but look at what's underneath it. What's underneath it is that connection between the place to go, the activities that you would do there, the, um, the commerce that can happen there, and the attraction of people to go there with the housing that's close to it, okay? And all of that is the bedrock for figuring out the, the, the way that we actually accomplish it. Um, so it's not just new housing either. We added up, if you put in these squares and those squares formed corridors that connected up and connected to the rest of the area, that you would actually be looking at new commercial developments um, on the order of 9,000 new jobs. So this just mining databases and putting in the, the shops and things along the corridors and in the squares and things like that. So not just piling people up, but creating an urban area. That's different. It's really different and it has to be done by design. Now, I told you we were gonna transition. Um, so let's look at Rickerton Ave. If Rickerton Ave is going to be part of this whole thing, it's going to have to be sort of like the circulatory system. And right now it's a clogged artery, <laughs> okay? You know, way too many cars per day um, going along Rickerton Ave because it exists, not because it's the best way to get anywhere. So if you can transition Rickerton Ave from what it is today through to being that transit corridor, that's what we're looking for, the steps to doing that. Um, where does it start? How long does it take? What do you do first? What do you do next? And so this is the transition plan that we came up with, sort of um, progressing from a um, sort of dedicated bus um, to uh, you know, unfolding the, um, uh, the priorities in different ways, getting the first legs of the tram up. And then finally, we, we, there's no reason for cars to go up and down that street. There's, there's Blenheim, there's, there's other places. And besides that, it all works without the cars in this area anyway for, for the uh, 20 to 40,000 people who move, who move around in that area. So just as inspiration, some pictures of places like that. Now, I wanna be real careful because one of the things I think isn't all that effective is showing you other places and what they've done there. What we really have to do is learn from what they've done there and apply it to here, the specific place, the specific um, land pattern that we have, the specific economic structure that we have. Um, and then, like I said, the biggest thing to do is figure out in this specific place how we would actually do that thing that you read about every place this has been done. There's a courageous leader somewhere who stood up and said, you know, we're going we're gonna to take off and go in a different direction. There's some courageous businesses who said, okay, we'll see what that's like with you. <laughs> and then there's a lot of arguing. And then that actually started making some progress. And man, once you start making that progress, it seems like, like things can just sort of tip over and people can start to see what you're talking about. And the arguing sort of starts to roll into action. So that initial step, that activation energy, if some of you know chemistry, it's like that. It's all there. It's all possible. And it is all better when you're done. But yeah, you got to figure out how to make those reactants go together in the direction you want. Um, part of that is to scope things out and price things out. So we actually did some preliminary work on laying out the trams, how many stops, ridership, the um, four, 400 meters from each of the stops, how many people are there and where can they connect to from there. Just doing, like I said, the foundation engineering for this. And what we got in this preliminary estimate, 18 kilometers of tram line can move 20,000 riders a day. That is so much different than the Greenfield concept. You can see right away why the Greenfield tram thing isn't ever going to work, or Greenfield trains. Um, because with a $2 fare, this is profitable in two years. 
all right? Pretty soon. So it's not like you'd build the whole thing all at once, but that first line connecting up the university and Rickerton to the central city, or even maybe the first line would be um, out some of these other ways if the central city is, is sort of lagging in its redevelopment. But on the other hand, if we figure out how to redevelop in a place that's not quite as contentious as the downtown, that learning, that understanding, those relationships of people working together cooperatively could actually drive that, that redevelopment downtown. Um, that's what I hope and believe anyway. Um, transition of roading, yeah, we have got ourselves into the box canyon of maximum car usage. We're gonna get ourselves back out. That all has to be engineered and planned because it's not easy. You don't just give up your car one day. You, you know, the, the infrastructure has to be ahead of that the whole way. So a little bit of a trick. Um, the spaces that we've built around those big parking lots, they all have to be transitioned as well. So if you look over time in different phases, probably, you know, 10 years apart, you can actually transition a big box store development built around a huge parking lot to a inner core urban area so we're talking you know one of those places that's that's right in the center of of um of a dense downtown and that's a very high activity area with still some squares that are the right size for public squares for public gatherings for weekend markets those things are there but believe it or not a big parking lot at a supermarket does not a square make <laughs> It, there's actually a lot of engineering that goes into a beautiful civic square where, where you know, 20,000 people go when it's um, Anzac Day, <laughs> where 20,000 people go when we've had a national tragedy, you know, that, that sort of thing. And right now we've got our Hagley Park, which is great for all 300,000 of us, but, you know, these smaller ones around and then feeding that would probably be a better city overall. Um, just the, some of the details of that are listed there. And so here's what Rickerton looks like today. And um, the, the picture was intentionally taken of one of the team members riding a bike, but you see the marked difference 100 years makes where there are no humans in this picture, only cars. And so yeah, Grayfield redevelopment, maybe it's taking back all of this and actually redeveloping it into something more on the human scale. Um, and how, that's what I hope we will just sort of go to a discussion about now. Um, I think the word of the day is cooperate and it's not, um, it's not easy, I'm sure. <laughs> and it's not the thing that we've all built up the best skills at outside of our own groups, because, um, I don't know, things have just gotten more contentious, right? You argue about things, you don't cooperate about things. But I think this sort of, um, way that we might do it is, um, Okay, there's a process called a charrette where you do have sort of the expert level on the foundations and the structures and the, uh, to use the building analogy, the HVAC systems, the plumbing, you know, if we're, if we're talking with an architect about a building, guess what? The customer isn't all that interested about how the electrical's laid out, how the lighting design is, right? They want it, they, they want to know paint color. So we can't get distracted by that layer of interest when we're talking about rebuilding a city. So if we could get the people who could do that hard work for us, figure out how those things go together and then get together as, um, how would I describe it? Like as a virtual village, we need all the people who would actually be in that place. Elderly people who I, I would like to retire in that place. Young families, I wanna live, I, I wanna raise children in that place. Um, a, a shop owner, I would like to have a shop in that place. And we get together and we understand from each other how it would work and we, we work through the detail design at that level. You know, that, that stuff that we need to do. But within the context of the expert foundations that have been laid, and with a four-day workshop, what we actually come out with is the plan. Not the plan in the, in the city council plan way, but something that's workable for development, something that's consentable, something that's affordable, something that's investable. That work has to be done again from the ground up because we don't have the ways to do it another way. We have the corporate way to do things, which is what's happening downtown, 
but we, we just don't have that village building experience that maybe our forefathers did. But they all shared the plan, didn't they? It looked an awful lot like the village they came from back in Sussex. <laughs> you know, and somebody, and they had a very autocratic and authoritarian structure where whoever's vision it was and whoever laid out the, the plan, that's what was gonna happen and everybody got to work. Well, now that we're working more in a democratic process and we're working on something that's really complex, um, if, if there's a process by which we put together all that knowledge from all those different people in all those different ways and come out of it with something that, that just is actually workable, then that's a huge contribution. And that, that's sort of a theory that I have of how we could actually do it. Um, and what I'm looking for is people who, you know, could you picture yourself being the person who would add into that expertise about wastewater? Shop ownership, foot traffic. I know what it's like to have a shop um, where people can only drive to it or where, you know, it's in, um, you know, on a street where there's always people walking by. You know, that, that you can actually add to it experience, understanding, interest from all sorts of different levels. Students, you know, um, I did an overseas exchange and I, I saw this thing called a co-op where, where students live in a big building together and they, they get a lot of experience um, running their own food system and uh, maintenance system and stuff like that and the costs are pretty low and, and I've seen how that works and I think we should do that. I think that we could put that here. Um, I'm not quite sure how it makes money, but, uh, but you know, we could work on that. So just that sort of thing that there's so many people with so much life experience and so many different things um, that they could bring it's going to be a bit of work to actually put together that framework in which we come together and actually be productive. It's not just a talk fest. We're actually working on a design by the end of it. We're working on, you know, something that could be actioned um, or at least the first cycle of that. <laughs> and then we do it again after we um, do some more numbers and do some more um, uh, assessment and calculation and costing and talking with people who are construction and stuff like that. We're, we're looking at putting together a little proposal to actually not do the whole thing voluntary the next round because we're actually gonna be adding a lot of value. If we do it right, we'll be adding a lot of value to the people who go ahead and invest in it. And what I've been told by people who think it's a good idea for us to do this so that they can build it <laughs> is that what we do is absolutely necessary. They can't do that. They can't do it. You know, think about it. A big developer comes in and tells the people of Rickerton their day's up. <laughs> That's just not the way it's going to happen. Now, they can go out to a farm out by Oxford and build a great big development out there. But that sort of urban redevelopment that we need, they can't do that. There's not a method for that, not a process. So um, what the word they use for it is de-risking that this kind of work, if we can do it, if we can get all those stakeholders together, if we can get something that the city council then says, yes, we, we will consent that as a unit. We will allow you to put in this um, area where you can bring in goods and secure it. We will allow you to do what you need to do to build this. Um, you know, if, if we can actually get that cooperation, then we de-risk the whole project of investing and building in this. So, you know, is that worth doing? Well, when I picture Christ Church in 50 years, I just want to see a city that's working and that was designed right back now, <laughs> back now, um, and that somehow went forward in a way um, that, you know, pe probably people in 50 years won't understand what our issues were that we were being contentious about because they're ours, they're temporary. They come from personal histories and stuff. But, you know, we've, we've got, well, we've got a bit of urgency because we really have to beat the Greenfield development or we'll be really sorry about that in 50 years or so. All right, so I think discussion can probably go from there, hopefully, um, because yeah, I, I just see a different future for Christchurch um, than sprawling across the plains and realizing that big mistake too late, not having enough money to fix it or do anything about it, um, and not improving our ability to cooperate or work together. So I, I think we could do something else. <laughs>